Welcome to the Eva Media World of Business Aviation podcast. Once again, I hope you're rejoining us. If you are, thank you very much. And as I always say, please do let us know what you think. I'm Paul Eden, editor of Eva Magazine. And although this is nominally a business aviation podcast, we're having a big departure from that today because we've got the wonderful Yvonne Moynihan joining us. Now, Yvonne is corporate and ESG officer at the Wizz Air Group. Welcome, Yvonne. Thank you, Paul, and thanks very much for having me. So good to talk to you again. No problem at all. Now, usually at this point, I say to people, I'll give you three minutes. Give me a pitch. Tell me about your company, about your job, what it is that you do. But your job for me is just it seems so big for one person. So I'm going to give you four minutes. Can you give us a four minute pitch? What do you do? (laughs) Sure. So, well, you outlined my my title at the outset. So corporate and ESG officer. So what what does a corporate and ESG officer do? Hmm. Well, I have, in effect, kind of five hats that I wear. So uh, under the corporate umbrella, we have legal government affairs, ESG and communications. So I have four teams which report to me under that scope so within the corporate so we have a a legal team which which has about maybe seven or eight people who are experts in in their particular fields with a a head of legal Uh, on the government affairs side we have a, a group of public affairs managers and regulatory managers so they are managing our stakeholder engagement uh, with governments with authorities and we also have on the regulatory side people trying to you know negotiate traffic rights and access for us and of course also part of that team as well are the route permits managers so they're kind of a 24 7 operation who are helping the planes get in the air essentially uh with communications uh again this is the team which is the you know, setting the strategy for what our corporate communications are and how we engage with our customers and with our internal people as well. Uh, and then, so that that completes the, the corporate uh, part of, of the position. So with ESG then, so that that's a very special department in, in my heart uh, because, well, I would describe myself as a justice seeker. So, uh, so now we, we call ourselves the defenders of climate justice. So we have a, a very small ESG team uh, and hopefully growing. So it, um, it's a small team, but we're very much focused on our sustainability strategy. Mm-hmm. So ensuring that, uh, you know, Wizair is complying with climate policy uh, and, you know, engaging the rest of the organization as well. So awareness for climate issues uh, and trying to create our strategy for the future so that we get to net zero. So that's by investing in new aircraft technologies and also sustainable aviation fuel. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, and we, we try to engage the, the, the rest of the organization. So we set up a project last year where we have sustainability ambassadors. So ac- across our network. So we have 20 or so sustainability ambassadors. And then finally, we have uh, I have the role of of corporate secretary, uh, so so that's um, it, it's an individual role, if you will. So as corporate secretary, I am part of the board of directors. So Wizair is a UK listed company, so it has an independent board of directors. There are eleven board of director, or there are eleven members, um, and they're spread across the globe. So uh, from all the way from Phoenix, where the chairman is residing, uh, to Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and Europe as well. So, <laughs> that- like I said, definitely four minutes worth of job there. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll examine some more of that role subsequently, but I'd like to sort of wind back to the beginning of your career. So, you graduated, I think, in 2007 and started working as a barrister. Now, when we've spoken before, you mentioned to me a lady called Susan Denham, who I think was the first female Chief Justice of Ireland. And I think she left quite an impression on you. So I'd love to know a little bit more about kind of when you started out as a barrister and also the the impression that she left. Yes, uh, she, she was an eminent lady. Uh, but I guess I, I met her maybe later in, in my right. barrister career. So when, when I when I look back uh from when I graduated as, as a barrister, I was very young at the time. I, I was mm. I, 21, right. uh, a little bit green around the ear. <laughs> yeah. 
so when, when I look back at that time in my career, I probably don't have a very positive um, experience when, when I think about it. Mm. Uh, and primarily because, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that particular career. And of course, I have a family and a lot of friends who are in that career, but it, it wasn't for me. Uh, so I, I feel fulfilled, I guess, and and it's it's a very unique and special bubble working uh, in in that sphere, uh, and maybe a little bit limited for my own particular passions. So, uh, but I think it's it's probably a good lesson as well that if you don't feel that a particular career fits for you, that mm -hmm. you should move on to uh to to another sure. career that you you can get more fulfillment. Yeah. So. So I think it was in around 2012, perhaps, where I had the, a great experience. I got to work as, you know, as as part of being a barrister with um, the Judicial Researchers Office uh -huh. at the time. So it was a small office of just six people who are young lawyers, uh, and they provide research services to uh, the judiciary of, of Ireland. Okay. And the... The person who was spearheading that office was uh, Chief Justice Susan Denham. So, and she was a very special lady because she was well the first of 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 her kind in mm. all aspects. So, I think she was the first senior counsel, the first woman judge to the to the High Court bench, and then the first woman judge to the Supreme Court as well. Wow! What was great about having her as as leading the Judicial Researchers Office is that she very much stuck to, um, her, you know, herself. She was her true self. Uh, she was very kind, very insightful, very generous of, of her time uh, mm -hmm. and, and very much a lady as well. And she was always, you know, and often the only lady in the room. Um, but, you know, she was very principled and she, in, you know, she was very knowledgeable in sharing her experience. And what stood out to me was that she simplified a lot of um, of tasks and she explained she, you know, she was on a mission to change legal language from being overly complex to be understandable by the common man. Um, I guess that skill is something that I've I've brought forward, you know, to this day. Um, very much, I believe, in clear writing clear communication uh, so that it's you know that your knowledge can be accessible for all mm, yeah okay that's that's a great story so you were a barrister for I think maybe seven years or so and mm -hmm. then you went and worked for Ryanair how does that happen how are you and I think literally you were kind of a barrister one day and at Ryanair almost the next yeah that that's exactly how it happens in typical Ryanair style <laughs> <laughs> So I really enjoy telling this story because a lot of people ask me, how did I end up in aviation? Mm. Because I'm now, you know, 10 plus years working in the industry. And it was by, you know, pure chance, or if you want to call it fate, that uh, I ended up working in, in Ryanair. So when I was working as a barrister, I was reading the Irish Times newspaper one mm. day. And I saw uh, an article with a picture of Michael O'Leary attached and he was in front of a, a number of Boeing aircraft looking up at the skies and the headline said, workaholic wanted. Uh, and there was an advertisement for a job in the legal department in Ryanair. And it, it, it was quite a, a feisty advertisement. So <laughs> yeah. it was offering the person the opportunity, you know, to have battles and, and fights across Europe. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I was experienced in litigation. So I, I thought, well, that, that sounds really interesting. Uh, and, and so I just responded to the advertisement and sent in my CV. And then literally a couple of days later, I was working uh, in in the in the madhouse, as we called it. <laughs> <laughs> the madhouse. OK, so knowing that you worked at Ryanair, I reckon just about anyone who knows aviation is going to say, what's Michael O'Leary like? Did you get to meet him? So what's Michael O'Leary like? And did you get to meet him? Yeah, that that, that is what everyone asks. <laughs> what's interesting even uh, is people would always ask, is he in the office? Uh, and he was in the office every day. Right. Uh, so, oh. you know, from, from seven until seven. So uh, he, he was very present and very hands on. So I mean I had a I had the experience of a lifetime with uh, you know working with Michael O'Leary. Um, I had you know a very 
direct interaction with him. Uh, you always have to be quick on your feet. He's very quick witted. Uh, so he enjoys if, if you can have a, a, a quick response and, and, and a funny response uh, as well. Um, but uh, he's he's very driven uh, and very interrogative. So one of one of the, the skills, I suppose, that that you learn under his uh, wing is he's always, you know, kind of thinking five steps ahead mm -hmm. and always questions so then you would train yourself to uh also you know think five steps ahead and think of okay what are all the potential questions he could ask me uh, so that you can be ready to answer any question that that comes to mind right. so yeah yeah he's obviously a person who's as you can imagine full of energy full of charisma um and, and also a, a very tough worker yeah yeah i'm guessing that he's a person who when an issue arises prefers you to present the problem and the solution rather than just the problem exactly and he doesn't mm. want to hear no for an answer so <laughs> that yeah. that exists so even if no is the answer you need to uh find a plan b and a plan c mm. yeah i think you you mentioned as well in the past when we've spoken he, he makes a point of knowing people of saying hello to people as, as he walks around the building yeah, so I mean, when at the time I was there, now it, it's it's quite a number of years, but there were maybe six floors full of people, uh, and he knew the name of of everybody in that building. So from the people on the reception desk, the security, the guys in the canteen, uh, you know, to everybody up and down every floor. So uh, it it was very endearing actually to to mm. see that and to learn from that as well uh, yeah. that. He, you know, you have to have humility um, and it's important to know everybody in your organization, you know, no matter what level of, of that corporation. Yeah. Yeah. So that obviously made an impression because you're 10 years into the industry and you're now with Wizz Air. So you're still with uh, low cost airlines. I wonder what's the attraction of low cost airlines in particular? Yeah, <laughs> uh, some people might say that I have a uh, Stockholm syndrome, uh, <laughs> because it's it's not an easy ride. But I I think that's that's probably I've always chosen the the hard path. I think, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think with well with airlines and with low cost airlines in particular, it's it's a roller coaster. Right. So no day is the same. Uh, but with low cost airlines, uh, they're very dynamic, very fast environments. So if you like problem solving uh, and doing it in a, in a quick and collaborative way, then, you know, it's it's the best environment that you can be in. Um, but in, in particular, what I, I like about low cost airlines is that, well, they're the most efficient. Mm. Uh, and we, I, I say that in terms of both economics and both and sustainability as well so because of the the low-cost model of investing in the best technology aircraft uh you know low-cost airlines are more sustainable by design uh and and, and so you know the, with the point-to-point -point operations um and, and also just giving that freedom to people to travel as well i think without the likes of wizz air and Ryanair, there's a whole demographic of people that probably wouldn't have flown before mm. uh, I could see it particularly in, in Wizz Air as we expand more to the east and, you know, to regions out, outside of the EU. Uh, for example, we recently ex ex expanded in the last couple of years to Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, and, you know, I meet people from those countries and how they say that, you know, they never would have been able to come to Europe, uh, but for the, you know, the, the low fares of, of Wizz Air. Mm. So it's great to see that democratization of of aviation with uh, with low cost airlines sure i can see people nonetheless thinking surely low cost because of what we see in the media the stories we see is all about making money so how can you balance obviously the need to make at least some money with reducing emissions and being sustainable is that is that a difficult thing to to work well, actually, I mean, people would be very surprised at, uh, you know, the margins that airlines make and in mm. particular low cost airlines. Uh, they are tiny. Mm. Uh, there's so much upfront cost and, and capital when you think of um, operations. First, you have the, the, the price of the aircraft, you have fuel, you have staff, you have airport charges, landing charges, ground handling charges. Uh, so, and then you have low fares. So at, at, at the end of the day, it is... Um, it's quite, um, you know, in, in, difficult to achieve a, a profit margin. 
uh, but then looking at the the environmental side so there's there can actually be a benefit to both so with the low cost model it's all about investment in new technology aircraft mm. um and we've invested in the aircraft the airbus a321neo so yes. that as a you know not only does it have economic advantages because it has more seats on board um mm. it's it's more efficient from a technology standpoint as well so it has lower fuel fuel burn and therefore low emissions so d- again depending on the the business model so um a low cost business model has both the benefits of being more economic and having less emissions and therefore when you're when you have that uh, you know in an economy of scale well then you know the the benefit is that you can profit from that but uh, you know so putting it all together when you have the the lowest when you're the lowest cost producer um and coupled with having the lowest emissions uh then that drives profitability so they go they really go hand in hand mm. okay okay um and i think with air as well is very involved in the whole sustainable aviation fuel um production almost as well and the strategy that you're planning is kind of 10 years from now 10 years from now until that 2050 that the industry has pledged that it's that it will try and achieve isn't that yeah. So, so we hmm? no, go on, please. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, this our sustainability strategy is really key to the the heart of our business. Uh and the the strategy, you know, as I said, we're sustainable by design. So we have the investment in, in our aircraft, but then with sustainable aviation fuel, that's really the 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 golden ticket to the next stage of mm. um of decarbonization. And you know, whichever conference you go to or article you read on aviation sustainability at the moment, it's all about SAF uh, mm. access to, yeah. to SAF. So that's, you know, key in our strategy at the moment is getting as much access to SAF as, as possible mm. uh, because the, the challenges right now are the availability and the cost. But, uh, you know, so that's why we've decided to invest in sustainable aviation fuel now. So in the production of it, uh, because that's strategically positioning ourselves to to counter the, the, the cost and availability challenges. Mm. Uh, so it's it's exciting because, we, you know, for the first time, so we're, you know, an aviation business, but now we're an investor in an energy startup and you start to meet all new kinds of stakeholders and people uh, and it, it's very exciting to see this new merger between different sides of of the industry and a lot of enthusiasm uh, you know for, for the future and hope for the you know for the ultimate decarbonization of of the industry yeah something that occurs to me there and I'm going to dash off script momentarily is that if the target ultimately is 2050 and we're now in 2024 it's it's well in aviation terms that's pretty quick in terms of development but that means we need young people joining the industry now to follow that through to 2050 and the aviation industry is always complaining about the lack of of young people so i'm guessing that within your teams you're always bringing people on and nurturing people to to carry all this ambition forwards yes uh it's actually wiz i think is a little bit unique so Maybe it's part of the the low cost model as well. We have a lot of young people within the organization. So the average age is 28 or or 29. Uh, We're constantly recruiting because we're a growth airline. So uh, of of all my teams, they are, they're very young. Most of them are in their their twenties and their thirties. So it's actually great um, because, you know, I, I really believe in servant leadership. So, I'm, uh, you know, always trying to, uh, you know, mentor them. I'm concerned about their learning and development, their career path forward. Uh, and, you know, the thing about the people joining WIS at the moment, they're they're joining because of our sustainability story. Uh, so there's a lot of passion for that topic. And no matter what uh, part of the business they're in, everything leads back to sustainability. So it's quite easy to motivate uh, you know the the people in the organization as well and uh, they really and truly believe in uh, net zero uh, and and so they're very much motivated by our by our story 
by our progress as well, especially compared to some of our competitors in, in the industry. Right. OK, so I'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit now. 2050, okay. will Wiz Air be net zero, do you think? <laughs> it's a difficult question. Uh, I mean, I, I would consider myself an optimist, uh, yeah. but also a realist. So I, I think that we have to believe that, well, not just with air, but the industry uh, mm. has to get 2050. An airline on its own cannot do it. No. Uh, it has to be an industry approach. And really, at, at, at the end of the day, and we're quite vocal about this as well, is, you know, the, the governments have a large role to play here. Uh, mm. What we have at the moment, if you look at what we have at the moment, it's an industrial challenge. Sure. Uh, we need, if we look at a net zero plan, in order to get to 2050, we need a significant amount of sustainable aviation fuel. We need carbon removal technology that's industrialized and, and we need hydrogen propulsion technology. Mm -hmm. So with the latter two, they don't really exist uh, mm -hmm. in either, you know, as a technology solution or also from a, from a cost perspective. Uh, so really, it's, you know, the, the governments have have committed. Uh, we have a Paris agreement. Uh, so it's it's really their job to support the energy suppliers, mm. uh, you know, and, and, and fund them. So uh, I believe that there have been many subsidies in the past given to the, you know, the traditional uh, energy sectors. So now it's to really focus on the re renewable energy. So you, airlines are um, are a purchaser of, mm. of energy. But really, it's, you know, that that funding needs to be given to the energy industry so that, you know, this in industrialization of, of technology can flourish. Yeah. So so basically, don't lose sight of the challenge. But you think with the right effort and the right encouragement, it's possible. A absolutely. Um, I, I, when I think about, you know, even using the terminology SAF right now, uh, I, I spoke at a conference a couple of months back, uh, which was called the SAF Investor. Mm. And I was panel discussion with uh, one of my former colleagues from Ryanair right. and and at the outset I, I I had a little bit of a ramble and I went off off script and I said well Thomas and I we had met in Ryanair he was a fuel manager and I was in the legal department but we were part of an ETS committee mm. uh, and when we were on that committee it was just a, a case of monitoring our um, emissions at, at that stage which was a, a regulatory requirement mm. but never would I have thought uh, you know, back then, which was maybe, you know, 2016, that mm. we would have sustainable aviation fuel in 2023, 2024. So I think even in that short period of time of, of 10 years, you know, we're already using sustainable aviation. Mm. Fuel. So it's just a case of mainstreaming it. Uh, and, and hopefully that accelerates in in the near future. And I, I think there is the, the will. And, mm. you know, there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, we're coming towards the end of our time now, but there's one more thing I really wanted to investigate. So I think it's fair to say that before Ryanair, a plane was just something that took you on holiday every now and again. <laughs> now I think you've you've probably been a bit bit bitten by that aviation bug. So what is it about the industry that that keeps you working in it and infuses you every day? Yeah, using the word bug is definitely the the correct term. Right. Or we say of kerosene in the veins or as i'm correcting people we have saf in our veins absolutely yep yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's really the fact that no day is is the same mm. uh, if you like adventure uh you're always going to get adventure in aviation uh and, and i mean the other thing which i like about aviation is that it, it, there's constantly a, a problem to solve mm. uh, so market access, whether it's, you know, profitability, whether it's trying to reduce costs, if it's, you know, trying to solve a customer issue. Uh, and, you know, for me as well, the the great thing about it is the the career trajectory that you can have in aviation as well. Uh, I, I think it's 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 fantastic. And, and especially for women now, uh, we can see that uh, women are having a lot of great careers in in aviation. So, uh, the uh, particularly in in the flight deck, we can see an increase in in diversity there, uh, and in a lot of the you know STEM areas. So we have more and more people in in operations, um, and finance as well. So I think that there there's a great career 
path for everybody. Uh, and that's the, the, you know, the other great thing about aviation is it's, it's international. Mm. Uh, and so it broadens your horizons in terms of, you know, different cultures, different ways of working. Um, but ultimately, everybody comes together at the at the end of the day with, with the same mission yeah. uh, to, to get those planes in the air. Yeah, wonderful. You know, I can't think of a better closing line to an aviation podcast. That was just absolutely perfect. So there I'm going to say thank you, Yvonne. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and to our listeners who are joining us, I want to say thank you for joining this episode, episode the World of Business Aviation podcast, even though we didn't talk about business aviation. Let us know what you thought. Let us know about any other guests. And just once more, Yvonne, thank you very much. Thank you too, Paul. Pleasure. <laughs>